Hello and uh, welcome everybody uh, to the final uh, event week of our research project, COACT. My name is Katja Meyer. I work for the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna. And uh, I'm uh, sitting here at the Vienna Woods in the sun. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our agenda today. So maybe you can click already on the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, from today and for the next two days, we will share and discuss our learnings and look ahead at what could happen to the knowledge and communities generated in our research project and with our research project. You can find more information on the coming days on the website coactproject.eu. And uh, today we are dedicating the discussion to the experiences of opportunities and hurdles when applying an inclusive participatory approach, namely citizen social science in a large international research project. So we will soon start a conversation of project members with civil society and policy experts. Uh, but uh, please, uh, the next slide. But before we, we come to that, let me briefly introduce you to the project COACT. So uh, COACT stands for uh, Co-Designing Citizen Social Science for Collective Action. It's a three-year research project funded by the European Research Framework in the program of science in and with, uh, sorry, for science with and for society. Um, next slide, please. The consortium uh, consists of higher education institutions, research performing organizations, non-governmental and civil society organizations, and global networks of open knowledge and data activism. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a, as I said already, citizen social science project that employs participatory research co-designed and directly driven by citizens and citizen groups sharing a social concern. And the next slide, please. And today here with us are the representatives of three uh, research and innovation actions, as we call them in the project. Uh, first and foremost, there is Isabel Bonnure and uh, Josep Barello uh, from the University of Barcelona, the Open Systems Group. Uh, you do not only uh, coordinate the COAG project, but you also lead uh, a participatory case study on support networks in mental health care, together with many stakeholders like the Catalan Mental Health Association and many more. Welcome, Isabel and uh, Josep. Among other uh, activities, you have co-designed and developed a chatbot uh, for the collection of relevant data. So we'll learn more about that in a bit. Please welcome with me uh, Teresa Wintersteller from the University of Vienna, the Department of Education, here representing our second uh, research and innovation action on youth employment. As a passionate uh, actionist researcher and social worker, I, I found this on your website, uh, you represent the Vienna case, uh, studying education and employment measures together with young people and a knowledge coalition consisting of representatives of policy and training organization with the aim to recommend new policies and action. And uh, last but of course not least, uh, hello dear Valeria, Valeria Arza, you are here for the Buenos Aires group and uh, come from the University St. Martin School of, in, of Economics and Business. You are also an independent researcher for the Argentinian uh, Research and Technology, uh, Technology Council. And together with your partners like FAN and many, many citizens, you, collect, uh, you collectively map and describe social and environmental problems in a contaminated river basin to build a public access knowledge base. And so finally, let me introduce you to Kersti, uh, who, who many of you have already met. Kersti Wissenbach from the COACT Partner Global Innovation Gathering, our expert in civic tech and open governance. And you will now moderate the discussion and introduce you to our invited guests. The floor is yours, Kersti. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Katja. And also from my side, welcome, everyone. Really happy to, to see you all showing your interest in, in our topic and our work, actually. So maybe, uh, Ricardo, you can put the next slide. So the framing of our overall um, panel today is, yeah, to, to share opportunities and, uh, and hurdles for an inclusive approach to citizen social science, um, bringing together our learnings from the last three years 
um, in working with very different communities in very different uh, contexts. And this is why the, well, the sense of participatory work lies in enabling inclusive engagement of all groups that are part of it or affected uh, by the social concern we are, we are dealing with. And for, yeah, for citizen social science, that means academic institutions concretely and civil society groups, organizations, ideally working on eye level. And who uh, provides multiple perspectives if everything goes right now, uh, multiple perspective insights and ideally departs from the problem statements and the research designs already co-created with the various communities. Um, and should of course benefit both sides if, if conducted through inclusive knowledge, knowledge sharing in, in all the steps uh, one goes through. Um, and then on top of this, CSS perceived from a global perspective also needs to be highly context sensitive. Um, what regards gaps between uh, academic and local communities, uh, cultural distances uh, or risks of cultural distances, etc. And um, CSS as such is a, is a fairly newly growing um, approach and, and community of course, but the critical discourse that underlies that, that we have also closely engaged with um in the social sciences but also on on community levels uh, has a long history and a lot of learners learning and practice around that of course um and what we see looking at civil uh, citizen social science that of course uh, it's still strongly rooted in within the academic institution so we wish to critically reflect from this perspective and and uh, and share how what that meant um when then doing doing our work so basically our partners that Katja has introduced will share their learnings in those regards um so yeah that brought us to an overarching question we want to address today and we want to seek to answer this is what can we hold up to if we seek inclusive participation linked to what i just elaborated and we we extracted three main questions to to discuss around that or to address, which is how far can we talk about citizen-driven research when it's rooted in academia? How do civil society organizations benefit from participatory research in their programmatic work? And do they need academy, uh, academia for it? And um, these last but not least, how can um, CSS enrich multi-perspective and inclusive policy making? linking to the fact that what CSS seeks to do is of course be relevant, be relevant to the local communities and that also then relates to um, having the capacity to directly inform re uh, relevant and, and local or local level policy making or policy shaping processes. So we want to look at it from these two perspectives, um, relevance for civil society and policy making. And Based to this, so we will address the questions by our own um, co-act members sharing their learnings from their uh, research and innovation actions over the last years, based on which we then invited three incredible personalities, outstanding experts from civil society and policy, which will respond to these learnings from this uh, from these two perspectives, no? relevancy for civil society and for policy shaping. And with this, I would briefly love to introduce the three of you. Your full bios you can find on the website, which we also put here in the chat, because you all do a lot of really, really um, amazing things. So I will just briefly introduce who we have with us today, uh, Gilberto Vieira from Brazil, who is the founder and CEO of Data Levy. Levy, which is a, a data organization in Mare, which is one of the, the biggest Brazilian favelas, uh, which is a project run by young residents of their in within their respective uh, communities. And he's also currently a PhD candidate on urban studies, where he's researching cent uh, the centrality of urban peripheries in the era of data colonization. So with Jill, we have a as an expert who has a deep, a deeply embedded in civil society work in respective communities and, and can share his perspectives from that uh, end. Then I'd like to 
Warmly welcome Linda Bonja with us, who wears many hats. So also here I have to cut it short. So Linda is the founder of the African Lawyers Hub and the Pan-African community, which is a Pan-African community uh, of lawyers. And among many other things, uh, they are offering policy alternatives within the tech policy arena of, um, uh, for African or of African governments. And she's also founded the Lawyers Innovation Hub uh, located in Nairobi, uh, which is um, um, which, which among many other things, recently launched together with Mozilla Foundation, uh, the African Law Tech um, in ah, sorry, the the lawyers have recently launched with uh, the the African Law Tech Association together with Mozilla Foundation, amplifying African voices um, within the continent. And so Linda stems a lot of experience in, in policy co-creation processes, policy processes relevant to local actors, and will share her perspective uh, from that end. And then I'd love to welcome as well Julia Mirales de Imperial, who is a specialist in public policy share, shaping and, uh, and will contribute with her deep insight in, in city level policy shaping and also being embedded in, in policy, uh, um activities from the practitioner from a practitioner and from a research uh, perspective and she's currently delegate for the science and um, university policy at the barcelona city council which gives us a very specific um local locality uh, related lens on the topics we will share today and so with this I, we can we can already go to the to the next slide. We have um, we have sh uh, well reflected beforehand, obviously, and um, we narrowed down the discussion we want to have today on two key learning learning areas. Let me call it that we identified, which is the first one: the need for more flexibility in participatory research processes, given that working with local communities in very different contexts people who all have very different needs, agendas, et cetera, PP, prompts us at um, the need for more flexible approaches uh, and across an entire research cycle or CSS cycle, which our partners will share more concrete uh, examples about in, in a bit. So this is our first topic we will discuss and have a discussion around after the input from our co members then with our three ex expert respondents. And then maybe we can briefly introduce the second topic before we then start the discussion, actually. So the second um, area we identified is the need to build from local experience in participatory research, which strongly relates to the knowledge, uh, to the needs of local communities and how very different contexts, be it political, cultural, communicational, infrastructural, etc., PP, actually impact um how things should be done how things are best done so this really relates how to better actually engage local experiences or more centrally position local experiences in uh, css approaches so with this i'd love to open the floor for the first topic we discuss so if we can go one slide back and then i'd invite uh, Teresa. perhaps if you would want to start to share your insights on this subject matter. Yes, of course. Thank you, Kersti, for the introduction. Thank you, Katja. Um, hello to everybody. Um, I will share now the insights on the topic of flexibility from our uh, research and innovation action with you. And I think the uh, most important point I want to make is that uh, in our r and action on youth employment, uh, flexibility meant to adjust our research process to the local conditions, um, which can expand or also limit the possibilities on how to conduct research or research project. So we worked, for example, together with employment institutions um, that had, of course, their own time schedule, their own agenda, which meant that we had to adjust constantly to the specific conditions uh, of the institutional environment. So um, 
young people were taken out of the research process by social workers or started an internship in the middle of the project. And in regard to citizen-driven research, the example shows that an equal negotiation of the conditions under which research takes place is very essential. And this is also related to the issue that researchers and co-researchers enter the co-research process from often very different situations. So while researchers often pursue projects as a profession, and thus can often bring more resources or more focus to the project, this is different for co-researchers. So the research project is often only a small part of the life in which other aspects, such as finding an apprenticeship place, uh, as in our case, can sometimes become more important uh, or have to be linked to the project. So therefore other needs, and in our case, the goal of the young people to find a continuing education or work must not only be taken into account, but must also be supported as part of the research process. And the process must be flexible enough to include other aspects of life world challenges as well. So designing a co-research process this way allows to also to, uh, also allows to reflect upon barriers of participation in research and contributes to the aim of CSS to include a variety of voices and perspectives in the research process and the resulting outcomes uh, as policy recommendations. Another point I want to make uh, regarding flexibility is that especially when it comes to young people, the introduction of research methods is one of the key benefits of using citizen social science collaboratively, since it introduces a new way of thinking about social issues. Uh, however, the methods also constantly need to be adapted to meet the ideas and needs of the research groups, of course. So flexibility in our case means to adjust the methods we work with um, in, collaborate, in a collaborative way with young people. And in our experience, it works best to adjust the methods we work with um, and have an assortment of tools and methods at hand to adapt a research project uh, to the process in the go. However, there is, I would say, a narrow line between planning and preparing um, these research approaches and being inflexible or unprepared for changing conditions um, of the needs of the research group. Um, so that's so far my input to this topic and I give the floor back to Kerstin. Thanks so much, Teresa. That's, uh, that's uh, really interesting. So co-researchers having yeah, other priorities uh, as one key takeaway here. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the aspect of, of methods which are not set in stone as perhaps in other, other pro, um, processes, right? I'd like to um, hand over to, I don't know, it's Isabel or Joseph sharing uh, from, from the Barcelona side. Isabel, thanks so much. So I hand over to you. Thank you, Kersi. Thanks a lot also to Teresa, Katja, and to everyone attending. So I will share a few uh, examples regarding practical uh, cases uh, where flexibility were, was needed, and um, especially related with the figure of co-researchers. As you, you may know, um, well, in our project, co-researchers were people uh, directly affected by a, a social issue. So in the case of Vienna, it was uh, you know, not, not working, no, no studying. And in, in our case in Barcelona, uh, it was people affected by mental health problems and also by families. So when we started the project in January 2020, of course, we had a nice access with a lot of timeline. Uh, milestones, deadlines, so everything seemed to be very well organized. And uh, of course, this was really quickly challenged by, by COVID, but, but not only. Um, in the first month of the project, we decided to, to create a chatbot and also to share through uh, this chatbot uh, micro stories uh, regarding uh, personal uh, experiences uh, in mental health. So that was really uh, challenging 
because of course it's not easy to to share such a, such personal uh, experiences uh, with such a sensitive team. So we started to to work with a writer, also with a Juawa, uh, which was uh, drawing um, small captions associated to the stories. But still, the writing process was uh, challenging. So after having um, recruited the, the co-researchers through an open call, so we, we had 42 uh, people involved. So, so we decided to, to invent, to invent a new research tool in that case. And we call it a uh, research diary. Maybe uh, Joseph, you, you can uh, share it for, for the chat. It's on the node, it's, it's uh, freely available. It's in Catalan book. Um, and, and this tool was inspired uh, both by the natural sciences and the, the notebook that we, we natural sciences, scientists, we, we have in the lab to take uh, notes of the experiments, but it was also inspired by the social sciences and the typical uh, field notebook where anthropologists or ethnographers are, are taking notes. So we, we did it. Uh, we prepared this document quite click quickly in, in a month, and it was uh, nicely uh, edited also by a designer. And we we sent it to the arms of the co-researchers, and it contained uh, both uh, very basic explanations uh, about the project, but also uh, it clarifies a lot the the terms of the project and um, what co-researchers will have to do, what we will do and so on. But the most important um, part of the research diary are templates where co-researchers uh, have very concrete instructions to, to write micro stories and a lot of guidance. And so this new research tool uh, was really useful during the, the two years of the projects. And we, we use it once again, one month ago in a, in a session. And uh, so, so the learning would be in that case that don't be afraid to, to invent something new. And also that non-digital tools uh, are still uh, very useful. And another point I would like to make very quickly, I don't know if I have so much time, it's also uh, regarding flexibility uh, of the engagement of the co-researchers. So we have a very uh, diverse group of people and also uh, they want to be uh, engaged in a different way. So first we organized online session, but also with uh, flexible schedules during the morning, during the afternoon. Um, we also organized if some people was, was missing some session, we, we try to be very traceable and also transparent. So after each session, we were sending materials, we were sending a summary, uh, if it was necessary, then some people, uh, we, with some people, we, we were doing one-to-one -one session. Um, and also another point is that uh, not all the people want to be engaged uh, in the same way and during uh, such a long time. So for example, after writing the micro stories, some co-researchers said, well, look, uh, I have done a huge effort writing these stories. And, and no, uh, I cannot be engaged during uh, two more years. And that was perfectly okay. So we, we told them that of course, and, uh, and uh, we asked them if they wanted to, to have some more news of the project, they say yes, and they, they stayed in a loop somehow. And um, if, I, if I can also uh, come back to the project. And, and that also happened with this case that some co-researchers were not so active during the chatbot launching, but then for the collective data interpretation, they came back and they, they did uh, really useful uh, inputs for the, they brought very useful inputs for the, this last phase. So here yeah, the learning would be really to, to consider uh, a very flexible engagement that, would, that, have, that has to be reversible and, and to allow uh, multiple types of engagement. I think I have no more time. So thanks a lot, Isabel. That's super yeah. interesting. So now, the, in your case, flexibility meaning even to adjusting uh, research tools. So then, pro obviously, that will also prompt the question: How flexibility are our funding models to do that? So it seems in the framework of this now of the Horizon 2020 
protect this was possible in in other scenarios perhaps this is more challenging so this is a zoom out and then of course asking a bit bit these instrumental questions now another thing i would like to briefly ask and then also i will al already um ask you valeria to to consider that as well since we have of course two policy experts uh, in the room to provide feedback to you as well um, we, we hear a lot of sharing now, of course, about the interaction between the co-researchers and the researchers or and the local communities and, and the research actors. Um, since you had a strong uh, vision to inform policymaking and, and have that and also wish to integrate this in the longer term approach, can you share some learnings or briefly also in terms on how this looked like? Have there been concrete activities engaging policymakers throughout these processes as well, for instance? Or how how is this um, no, how is the policy shaping or informing uh, aspect actually uh, dressed? Isabel, maybe if you can um, briefly. Uh, share how if there was any concrete activities in those regards on your end and otherwise uh, when I, I will I will hand over to Valeria and we can discuss it from the Argentinian perspective. Um, sorry, I was a little bit <laughs> disconnected. Can you just um, ask again, just the last? I'm relating to the policy aspect. So we are addressing two not two questions today, which oh, the one relates, of course, to the, the, the need or the relevancy of a, C a CSS approach for civil society actors. And, and the other on how uh, such activity frameworks can really inform policymaking, which was one core objective, of course, uh, also within COEC. So now we, we're hearing a lot of fascinating insights and learnings uh, in relation to engaging the local communities and the co-researchers. Um, but also to give some food to our our policy experts, I I, I was asking uh, how this activity look like looked like, or if there are critical learnings also from how you were able to, yeah, to engage or to inform policy yeah, course, shapers, course, yes, let's sorry. say like that. Yeah, of course, of course, because also um, in correct in general, we have two two different groups of of uh, participants engaged. Uh, on one end, the co-researchers. And uh, on the other hand, a, a knowledge coalition uh, that was made mainly uh, of uh, institutions, so public uh, public administrations, uh, associations, and so on, that were uh, really engaged from, from since uh, the first months or few months of the project. So they really uh, had the opportunity to, to, to learn from the project and to start building also all the the research process with us. So they were really uh, also at the core of the, of the project. Thanks a lot. Then, uh, yeah, Valeria, I would hand over to you and yeah, also ask you to perhaps address the, the both uh, questions or aspects we're trying to tackle today. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I will share a bit about uh, the, the different aspects why we believe that flexibility is key, it's a key strategy uh, in citizen social science. Uh, and I had in mind to present three issues, but two of them have already been presented by the previous Research and Innovation Action. So I will focus on one of them, that is to be flexible in relation to the main content of research. So for instance, in our case, and this is related to policy as well, Kirsty, so I think you will be happy. Uh, so in, in our case, for instance, uh, when we started to, to do this co-design uh, co uh, workshop with co-researchers, uh, they had the expectation to connect citizen social science with environmental education. And, and this was something that was uh, unplanned in our research and innovation action. As Isabel said at the beginning, our project is a very structured project. We have specific tasks a specific work within specific work packages. So when we started to interact with uh, co-researchers and they had the expectation of connecting this approach with environmental education, we need to squeeze into our timeline new activities related to, to, to align, to better align our research and innovation action to the expectation of our co-researchers, right? And of course, uh, we, we, we discussed with them, 
uh, why this was needed. And we understood that there were many very good reasons why uh, uh, it was uh, a good idea to connect citizen social science with environmental education in the context of uh, transformative actions towards uh, environmental uh, justice, right? That is the, the, the topic of our research and innovation action. Why is that? Because both approaches, citizen social science and environmental education, both of them had the goal of improving skills and improving attitudes to take care of the environment, right? And this is, was something that we learned during the co-design workshop with the uh, co-researchers. And one good reason why it was a good idea to start trying to make this connection was related to a new law that was uh, uh, happening in Argentina at the time, that was the law on environmental education. So we, it was a good idea to seize that opportunity given by the uh, national law on environmental education uh, for the sustainability of our research and innovation action. Because if we manage to make a connection between a citizen social science approach and environmental justice, uh, sorry, and environmental education for environmental justice, we could include our digital platform as a tool to be used on regular basis in the classrooms, right? So this could promote uh, sustainability of the research and innovation action. And this is what totally unplanned for our original plans. Of course, we, uh, uh, along the project, we engage with, uh, we made new alliances with, with, uh, with education organization, and we uh, included many activities related to that. But this was, uh, there were many reasons, but one of them was to say an opportunity that was uh, given by the by the Congress uh, with the approval of a new uh, law on environmental education. So that was one aspect of flexibility that I want to raise. The other two aspects, and very briefly, are related to one of them to what Teresa said, that is to always be ready to adapt your action to the needs of the organization that are participated in the, in the, in the action as co-researchers. So they have their own agenda and you need to fit your agenda into their own agenda also to uh, make them uh, uh, obtain more immediate benefits by participating in your action. So they participate in the research together with you and you uh, work together with them in their own programmatic work and by jointly uh, uh, define the, the, the goals, then both uh, the, the civil society organization that participates and the project, they could both uh, uh, fulfill the, their own agenda. So the flexibility was needed uh, also to make uh, better benefits or more immediate benefits and then increase the motivation for participation of the civil society organization in the project, right? You need to be ready to adapt your plans to their plans uh, for, uh, for, for, for improving and obtaining more benefits for all the parts in being involved. And finally, very, very briefly, is uh, related to what uh, Isabel said, that flexibility was also needed to uh, enlarge and extend the participation of a wide, diverse community of actors that in our case, uh, the, this diversity has to do mainly with digital infrastructure, connectivity, and um, digital literacy, that all of, that all of that was needed for participation in the context of lockdown restrictions uh, during COVID. And there were many different situations. So we needed to be, uh, to be ready to be adapted, for instance, to adapt, for instance, the informed consent, proce informed consent procedures in the go for allowing everyone uh, to participate uh, according to the digital infrastructure, according to the digital literacy in uh, these uh, virtual workshops. And we also needed to adapt the methods for participating in the virtual environment to all the different circumstances of the different participation if we wanted to extend participation to a wide community of, uh, of actors. And I think that's it. Thank you so much, Valeria. This is also really insightful and yeah, shows us basically that Besides, we're now we're always strongly focused on collective research methods and, and, and how to set up those, but also the, let's say, the soft layer around that, the community building on how do we want to work together? How do we and can we communicate? No? So breaking through these silos is equally important to, no, to, to nurture 
uh, an environment that, that works for everyone um, like longer term. And, and then the, the policy aspect, of course, now this looking on, yeah, building on, on existing or emerging opportunities also, no? And looking where we can actually, yeah, again, breaking through silos and connect to policy frameworks uh, or dynamics that are already there that can, can enable and also strengthen processes that we are um, seeking no? to, to shift. So these two, two takeaways, thank you so much to all of you. So I would then now love to um, open up to, to invite uh, our expert respondents into the discussion and share their thoughts from, from their perspectives and, and their embeddedness, deep embeddedness in, in their respective context on what, what you have heard. I, I'd love to, that's fine, start with, with, with Jill. And um, you know, from a community perspective that you also work very deeply embedded in local communities, but also as an academic with different communities <laughs> in very different contexts than, mm -hmm. than the three that, uh, that we have now heard about. So I'd like to yeah open the floor and hand over to you to 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 share your feedback. Okay, okay. Good afternoon for everybody, or good morning for who stay on the other parts. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I love this project, and uh, we have been discussing this topic since a lot. Um, second, congratulations you all for the work that you done. I think it's super hard to do this. It's for me, it's the most challenging thing to do at the academic fields today. It's how can we really engage um, uh, communities to, to the research, to, to make the, the university and the theories about the, about the society better. So congratulations for your work. Um, I don't know, I have many things to, to say. I think you, you get uh, great achievements and great uh, questions. Um, I, I, I I'll focus on three things that I learned, that I listened now, and maybe Linda and Isabella, maybe you can continue the, the, the conversation. But uh, Teresa said about, about boundaries uh, between the, the co-researchers, the communities, the researchers who are lead the, the, the the project and and I'm and since my experience here on the on on my project, I work with uh, local communities for I don't know 15 years, and for all this time, we get a lot of people from the universities, from different kind of projects, come to us and said, Ah, we need to, we want to research something, we want to know better something, or um, and we always in different ways, in different layers, we always ask to ourselves. And with the time we start to ask from, for the researchers, what I gain, what, what I get out of it, you know? So, um, and I don't know if you, if you face yourself with this question of people from the communities that what, what I really get out of it, what I gain with all this process that you will spend my time, I'm really fighting here for, for change and for being survived and, and, and blah, blah, blah. So what, what can I, so I think this, this word that, that, that uh, Teresa used, like the, the, the boundaries around what, um, what time finish my participation on this research and where it start my, my protagonism on this research, you know, or my place, my real place on this research as a community or as a policymaker or as a polythinker about the about my project or, or about my, my my problems that that is around my my con my community. So um, I don't know, uh, there's some way, I, I, I'm really curious about the, the research, of course, we didn't have time and we don't have time to know better about your research, but I was, I, I stayed with some, some questions like, what these, these Teresa's young people that she worked with, uh, what, um, what these young people could do with the results of this research, you know, or maybe, maybe the, they, 
they get some, some new way to get employed, to get work with the research. I don't know, it's, I don't know if it's possible, you know, but maybe it's make the thing more, more close to the, to the thing and maybe it's change a lot of the, of the plans that you did. And I will get inside the second point briefly. It's that the flexibility, the real flexibility of the thing. And um, when Kersi told me about, oh, we will discuss about flexibility. I need to confess you that I, I stay to think about what kind of flexibility we are talking about. You know, uh, th the question is just to adapt ourselves, you know, uh, because me as um, uh, 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 an activist researcher, <laughs> I'm, I'm always had to adapt to the parameters of hegemonic science in order to exploit the knowledge that I brought from the field, you know? So flexibilizing should be closer to transforming, changing, you know, like ah, in the epistemological sense of the terms, you know? So I'm glad to, to hear uh, uh, Valeria and Isabel about we need to change everything because the agenda of, of, of the community is another one. So we adapt, we not just adapt our research, but we change it, you know, we transform it in another thing. And I think bring communities to our side, to our side of the, uh, of the academic fields of think theory with communities is maybe about transform our way to think about the problems, transform our way to, to think about science as we have been thinking until now, you know? So I don't know, just, uh, 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 just uh, thoughts and, uh, and questions, uh, no clear things, but things to, to start to think and, and talk more after, so. Thank you so much to, yeah, it's a question yeah, we also did you know, pose a lot and it's probably, yeah, something you could take away for us, this, uh, yeah, thinking, not of acting within this shell, but also, yeah, being aware of we are acting within a, in a shell, so in a system which potentially systematic, needs systematic adaption as well, uh, relating to not prompting those questions like what is science, how it is prominently still perceived and enacted, and what then if we enact with CSS or as CSS uh, actors, be it practitioners or researchers, what is also our responsibility to, sh to, to um, advocate certain shifts and adaptations on the systematic level? If I got you right, uh, no, um, yeah. Thank you so much. So I'd, I'd invite uh, yeah, our experts response before then opening up also back to, to to you, Teresa, Valeria, Isabel, and, and also then to, to our, our participants, to our audience, to actively engage. So, Linda, I'd love to hand the mic over to you uh, to, yeah, to, to share your feedback from, from your perspectives. Thank you very much, Kasti. And I would um, want to congratulate the good work that has gone into this. Um, I do have a few reflections as I listened in. Um, and one was on the use of local expertise, which I think is really important. Um, that resonated with me because um, within the continent in Africa, and I think majorly the global north, um, what happens with aid, even aid that comes into research, means that it comes with personnel and expertise. And a lot of this expertise is foreign to different countries. And so um, sometimes this expertise really does not understand the context in which they are working. Um, and I think lack of context just means that we have more research that's gathering dust and cannot be implemented. Um, and so I think that point really resonated on the fact that there has to be contextual knowledge and local expertise. Um, because that, that, that really helps to solve the problems we are solving for and not just necessarily um, have you know, things on the bookshelf. But then also I think that tied between, <clears throat> tied in with the point around the gap between academia and industry. Uh, that many times you have really great research that's done at universities 
um, done with uh, within think tanks, but then that's not meet the need of the industry, uh, the need of practice. Um, and this we see a lot of, you know, um, in the work that we're doing. And so how do we properly disseminate the research and the learnings that we have so that people actually have access to this information? Um, so I'll give you an, an example of something I've been learning lately um, about climate change in Africa. Um, so one of the, one of the things that um, we are learning about Lake Victoria, which is a fresh water lake um, somewhere where I come from, um, a lot of the fish are moving towards Uganda. We share a border with Uganda. And I learned that due to climate change, the, um, the silt, which is like sand at the beginning of the lake is shifting. And so what that means is that more and more fish are actually moving towards, um, towards Uganda for that very reason. And so there's an economic, there's, a, there's been a spot or um, um, a tip for a, some little mini war between Kenya and Uganda. Um, or regarding the lake. And apparently researchers have actually done some bit of work on why the fish are moving. So it's just not necessarily just being that farmers are going towards Uganda, but it's because of climate change. And it's something that's so easy to fix to ensure that the fish actually come back to the Kenyan side. Um, for researchers, it's pretty easy. But for people who are sitting as, as policy makers in parliament and those that are implementing, they see this as a national security problem, yet it's not a national security problem. It's actually a climate change and environmental problem. Um, but if we get insights into such research, then we actually solve for the problems that the researchers really set out to, to solve. Um, so I think that the point on filling the gap um, really resonated. And there were also you know, comments on the siloed approach where everyone wants to do things in their own silo without necessarily seeing how, you know, um, there can be participation from the citizens to academia, to policymakers, to be able to solve for, for these problems. Um, I also thought about the much needed data that's lacking in policy processes, um, that, you know, this research is really, moving towards providing data that's needed in terms of the, the policy making processes. And how do we make you know, um, the flexibility that we talked about in terms of policy making? I think policy making is really long and tedious and structured. Um, and so I think that one of the ways in which we encourage um, participation in policy making processes is before it gets complex, before it gets into um, into formal systems. So I'll give two examples that I think that the discussions that are happening now around the, the EU AI Act, for instance, um, the easiest way to engage now is to continue to offer thought leadership in the process. The moment this becomes law and it's implementable by the commission, it's really hard to change things. And so how do we identify areas in which we are still flexible in the lawmaking process, in the policy making process, rather than when it's late in the day, that nobody wants flexibility, they want compliance. And so to balance between that compliance and public participation, and already different legislations provide for public participation. Um, and so this can be at individual level, or it can be at institutional level, where we see um, and I'll just give uh, an example that I'm you know, very familiar with. We see this within the, the AI community um, in, in Europe where organizations are coming in to participate um, to be able to have their voices heard. People are running hackathons, but then that cannot be done forever. There's a point where it actually becomes low and nobody wants flexibility. They would want compliance at that point. And so I think balancing those interests and really knowing when we can intervene in terms of our opinions, our research um, in, modeling, um, in modeling the law. Um, so I think that those would be my, um, yeah. Thanks and so much. Oh, yeah, sorry, maybe just one last point, just one point on how does, what does public participation prevent? And you know, sometimes we, you know, we come from such stable democracies that we don't think about where democracy is fickle and volatile. I was in Somalia maybe two weeks ago, and um, I learned so much about the, 
the spaces we enjoy in public participation and what a what on country looks like. Um, and so sometimes public participation in these processes and that flexibility just ensures that there's no war, that it's stable, that democracy is stable and people continue to engage and they feel hard. They feel that they participated and so they don't have to go to the streets to be hard. Um, and so I think really to, um, you know, um, really explain this and keep nailing this and saying that flexibility and participation ensures that there's actually stabilities for democracies that are very volatile. Thank you. Thank you so much for emphasizing this. And this also directly links back to the overall first point you made about contextuality, um, no, which is needed in general and a very strong and credulous attention uh, cranial attention to, to to contextuality and that also relates to no linking to what Teresa uh, that, um, shared now so what is one co-researcher's burden is another co-researcher's opportunity and perhaps even safety pillar so we have to be very very uh, attentive to the different context and yeah I, I like the example also or the, the statement you you made about um uh, when it comes to policy making, identifying areas where we have space to intervene, where there's an opportunity to craft also, rather than uh, choosing the the, the high uh, brick wall where we would just be running against. So, uh, yeah, um, linking linking CSS research to concrete opportunities in a very sensitive manner. We have a few minutes left on this first topic, so I would uh, directly invite Julia to share your insights, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's been very interesting until now. So very briefly, I'm Julia Miralles. As Kirsty explained, I'm the Delegate for Science in Universities at the Barcelona City Council. This means that the Barcelona City Council has a specific policy strategy for science. I don't know if you are hearing me well. I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, so please just use us if we can be of any help uh, for you to have the support of the City Council in Barcelona to work in some kind of uh, project of our city science office, please contact us. Um, a lot of interesting ideas have already shown up, and I think that it's clear this need for flexibility. You, know, you present it from different citizen science projects, from uh, different stakeholders, also as if from research or from research and collaboration with civil society. I would like to talk just to comment on some ideas that came to my mind in relation to the administration. I think, and I'm sure you will agree with me, that it's not easy to work from, in this case, from research projects or citizen science projects with the administration. This requires flexibility from the part of the researchers. I'm sure that um, there is some kind of requisite sometimes formalities, bureaucracies that should be met if you want to work with an administration, and also the schedules, the speeds are not always the same, you know, the ones you would like to have in a research project and the ones you have in the administration. I think this is, of course, a, challenges, a challenge for both parts, but um, we should really be, um, be capable of showing which is the interest on keep working on these collaborations between, in this case, citizen science projects and administration. I think that uh, this, what do I get that Gilles was talking about, is also very present on the administration. Um, but I think that there are at least two central points of which is the interest of working with citizen science projects. First of all, I'm sure they help us detecting and defining public problems to tackle from the administration uh, from a more complete and more participatory, of course, way. This idea that Linda also commented on the late data lacking uh, in the administration to design public policies. When we think about data, sometimes we think about very complex data sets of big data and IA, and it's unnecessary that, no? Sometimes we just need to have more tools to hear and to know what are the citizens' needs. Um, so this is true, of course, the detection, the definition of public problems, but also the presentation of possible solutions, more creative solutions or approaches to these public problems. Um, I think that uh, we should be careful of keep working hard to make this the interest both for research and for administration on citizen science projects to be more spread 
because my fear sometimes uh, when I work on that is that we are uh, some people that we are really eager to work on citizen science. We are really eager from the administration to work with researchers and to work on this kind of participatory projects. But sometimes we are always the same people, no? So I think that uh, we should keep working to make all the administration be more prone to this kind of collaborations, more open to, to society, and in this case, to this kind of research projects, and also from the part of the researchers to not be the only ones, not the ones that do citizen science, this kind of researchers. For me, the idea, and is what we are trying also to boost from the, from the Barcelona Science and University policy, is to uh, try to boost, as I said, a more open, a more collaborative approach to research and to science. That I'm sure that at least in social sciences, it's not only possible, but it's absolutely necessary and enriching. And maybe in the same next point, we can keep talking about other points. Thank you so much, Julia. These are yeah, very great points also. And yeah, I mean, just linking to what you say, now we need to be more open and always being aware of perhaps we are quite a, a bubble, no? uh, that we really prioritize these methodological approaches, this engagement, the participatory uh, way to go <laughs> to address certain things. So the question then is, yeah, how can we become more open? How can we become more visible as a starting point to become more open? But it also directly relates, I would uh, therefore to, to close this topic, link back to Jill, what he said, as from a core research perspective, as well as from a, a policy maker perspective, what's in there for us? So if this is the driving question, what do we actually have from that? What do we get out of that? How is this relevant to us? I think we can um, and really use this as a guide. Uh, we can uh, we can solve a lot of um, exclusionary factors of this. So thank you all so much. I would like to, um, we're a bit out of time. I'd like to open up to the audience, but also of course give a brief moment um, to our uh, co-actors to uh, eventually respond to certain questions uh, the three of you post. And otherwise, for the audience, please feel free to or put your questions in the chat and we will read them out or preferred to uh, foster this engagement and, and an actual conversation. Just raise your hands if you click on the little smiley uh, on the lower um, button of the screen uh, reactions. You can raise your hands and then we can uh, um, one by one pose our questions and our, our feedback. Thank you so much. So anyone who would like to, yeah, to ask something or to, to share. Teresa. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, since I got like a direct, direct question, I, I wanted to take up the point of like, what do people get out of it and especially uh, young people? And I, I wanted to I do not want to explain like how we did it in our project or not in detail, but I want to bring up the issue of this discourse about empowerment, like that if young people participate in a, in a participatory project, they get empowered, which I find very problematic and which is like this, okay, we give you knowledge, we give you like um, enlightenment. It's like it's, it's connected to this enlightenment discourse of science too. And I think um, one should be very careful in going into this direction and think more of of practic practical um, things that young people get out from the research res research or also um, tools they get at hand and they choose for themselves. Okay, we want to develop this this um, policy demands and we take them. Um, for example, to the institutions, like in our case, they had like we collaboratively developed these demands and they had the possibility to take them wherever they wanted. And like we supported them also, like if they wanted to to bring them to like institutional um, leaders and discuss them with them or something. So I think that's something more practical and yeah, um, more useful than having an abstract discourse about it. That sounds great. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing some more insights on that. I think it's also directly responding to Tuberto's question, right? Anyone else, please, uh, yeah, raise your hands or, or write in the chat. Valeria? Yeah, yeah? <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't find the 
the digital hand there. Um, yeah, I agree totally agree with Teresa. I was going to say also about uh, the, the practical benefits that they uh, participants could get from participation. I mean, this is this this is something that we learned during the action because we also came up with this uh, like more long term uh, impact that we expected from our data from the data collected in the platform. Uh, so we 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 came with this discourse of this data could be used for this and this. Uh, this is not something that I mean it's it's not concrete enough for motivate participation. But we we learned from uh, from our activities that we needed to be uh, ready to participate and to uh, co-organize activities that were already in their own agenda, in the organization's agenda, the civil society organization agenda. So there, then they they really feel uh, that they, they they got something as an immediate impact, as an immediate benefit from participation because they could organize their agenda with a, a research group, with other stakeholders. We could enlarge their networks by, 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 by participating in um, advertising, advocating their activities that they were doing. So uh, one learning that we got is that to be ready to think about what immediate concrete benefits participants could get from participation, from participating in the action rather than that, of course, this longer term impacts is something that we, we, we still think about because we, we believe in them. But uh, in order to motivate participation and to be ready to have an answer to that question, what do we get from here? Is we need to be uh, thinking about strategies and alternatives to uh, really delivering something immediately, uh, that something they, 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 they would like to obtain from them, or they would just feel concrete uh, in, in in the in the in the very process of of, of of participation in the research and innovation action. Thank you so much, Valeria. Um, Isabel, very shortly, for the sake of time, we really have to go to the to the second topic. Sure. So I, I just wanted to to say that, uh, like Teresa and and Valeria, that, that was a, a very big question we had to answer, and also in our case, there was something more. Um, people said, and this is their very voices, they said, at, at least in this project we are studying, we are not the one uh, being studied. And for them, it was really, really important to take this responsibility to, to study mental health uh, in a horizontal manner. And uh, yeah, that was another, uh, an important motivation, I, I would say. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks. So maybe we can put the slide on with the with the second topic briefly again, uh, Ricardo. And then, yeah, I would. Can we put the share the the slides again, please? Great. So then, yeah, we we come to the the second topic. So the next slide: the need to build from local experience in participatory research, which of course also strongly relates to these uh, different layers and uh, aspects of flexibility we have already tapped into. No? So co-researchers have their own agendas and availabilities, um, their ways of engaging, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and different uh, different ways of engaging uh, work in different contexts and so on. So, yeah. Partially, we've already tapped into it. I would now again hand over to Teresa and ask everyone kindly to be very, very time conscious so we can catch up a bit with the time we are behind them. So Teresa, over to you. Thanks, Kirsty. I try to keep it short. Um, so I want to make like two points um, on this topic. And the first one is that in our collaborative research setting, we always start from the experience uh, the young people have in regards to education and employment. It's like they set the topics we do the research uh, about. So we start with what they, uh, what issues they have um, when looking for an apprenticeship place of a continu continuing education. And Participatory research allows to, to embed, I think, personal experiences and stories and perspectives into a greater societal context and, and connects them to discourses and issues relevant to the, 
to the co-researchers. I think that's the one um, big point um, we can take from citizen social science here too. And especially when it comes to the transition from school to work, there is like this tendency to, to individualize challenges. So like the failure of a seamless transition um, is attributed to the individuals and their mistakes and they're not being good enough. And this leads to employment measures that focus increasingly on employability of young people, on skills training, on um, getting their language up to date and everything. But it does not consider like this um, issues of social inequality, which we can address in citizen social science. And um, like the other point I want to make um, is that in our research project, like Isabel already talked a lot about it a little bit, is like we had like this knowledge coalition we built in our project. And in, we invited also like different stakeholders to, to be part of the research project. And bes besides discussing like the aims and ideas of, um, of our project, we opened up also a space uh, for them to articulate their needs and ideas, what would be valuable uh, outcomes uh, of the project for them. And this too led to the introduction of new formats, which also relates to what Valeria mentioned before. There we see also like how the topics are intertwined so much. Um, so we invited, uh, invented a format that uh, invited trainers to um, discuss their challenges of distance learning in times of COVID-19 and other issues of importance to them because they articulated the need. They need to have a space where ca they can exchange each other, like discuss topics. Um, and this format was not provided um, by the institutions. And the other format we introduced was an event um, to evaluate like a specific measure in this uh, employment um, area together with young people. Um, who were participating in this certain kind of matter. So, and both stemmed like uh, from the needs of the community we were working with. Um, however, like citizen social science also have the, has the ability to create like new spaces, I would say, like especially in, in co collaboration with the Knowledge Coalition, uh, we opened up like transversal spaces, I would say, of exchange and communication uh, between policymakers. Um, in a usually quite hierarchical field. Like it was very valued that we provided a space where people who usually come together only in very formal formats or even not at all. Like for example, people from ministries um, talking directly to coaches of young people. Um, that there was the possibility to have like a lot of exchange and yeah. And it was like commented that like we had like this neutral position, which I highly doubt, but it was perceived as something that we could provide because they themselves could not provide this space or would could not provide a space where people had the feeling they could openly discuss the topics of the co-research. So, and this was also only possible because we had like a lot of exchange with the stakeholders before and yeah, and also from our position that we as research, researchers are not responsible for policy decision making. So I think that's the two points I want to make. And Thank I you so the floor Thanks back to Kirsty. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, uh, important points. So agenda setting and uh, and creating locations, creating spaces for specific um, uh, conversations or discourses. And then, yeah, of course, uh, always the question systemically, how do we have to approach it? No, what is then our responsibility also to, to in, intervene in certain systemic uh, shortcomings? And of course, what you mentioned, and that's a power discussion, um, creating new spaces. But then the question is how power neutral are they if they are hosted by academic or within academic institutions where we're actually working with South, so civil society groups who um, who could have the ownership on that and how could this be enabled within a CSS approach, no? Um, probably something as this approach goes further to, to really proactively discuss and, and reflect upon and act upon. So with this, I would hand over to Joseph to share your learnings from the Barcelona perspective. Thank you, Kirsty. Yeah, so from Barcelona, I'm, I'm talking in, in relation to the mental health case. 
um, I would just would like to mention three issues, uh, and uh, and also the first one and in, re in relation of what we mean by local. So I think that in mental health, uh, people with problems of, of mental health, they already have the wisdom, you know, to, uh, maybe not the knowledge, but maybe the wisdom of, of really, really facing their own problems in relation to mental health. And the problem mostly here uh, that we faced is that this knowledge or this wisdom is not shared. Okay, so, so and that's maybe the challenge of a research that is made in common, that, uh, that to try to find out the places or, or the connections or, or be able to, to have uh, all people together and really share their own particular living experiences. No? So, and this also links with, a part, with someone already mentioned no? about the, where the knowledge is. No? And, and I think that that's a really important point here. And, 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 and also it, 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 it has a very interesting tension for me that links individual knowledge and collective knowledge. And I think that here citizen social science can make a very nice bridge. And this also links also another kind of tension that is between the qualitative knowledge and the quantitative knowledge. No? So, so for me also that in, from, in terms of local, I mean a lot, uh, in terms of local, I mean mental health issue, no? which for me, that's the local, no? that's the situated knowledge. That's also for me very interesting. And, and, and we have tried to combine both. Uh, with a collective data interpretation. So taking back data from chatbot and, and open up this data and discuss together what this data mean, okay? First of all, because there is no data in relation to mental health except from service, okay? So how many people are using a given service, but this is not telling us the mental health issue at all, okay? So that for me, that was a very important point. And I think that that's something that we would like to further explore in. In, in future because there are other cultures that are much more, uh, that have more experience that is on the deliberation of this. So on, on looking at citizen parliaments that can use citizen science data to go further and work together, okay? And a particular issue that because they are truly isolated, these people, they don't have a really, they cannot have the spaces to share the knowledge. And when they have the spaces, it's very difficult to link this knowledge, okay, because the, we don't, we, we are ma maybe we are not sharing the, the same protocols or the same kind of language. And that's one thing. Uh, and the two others, I will be much faster. So it's more, um, there is already a nice community on uh, civil society uh, organizations that are working in the field on, on mental health. No? For us, it was a very nice challenge to understand the project itself as a new community that is able to combine the knowledge is that they already have, okay? Uh, and to find a kind of a space that is more related to research, let's say, which it brings everything to a much more neutral space. And to have a space there that what we have been trying to do during the process and the project is to always share the data, even if it is ongoing process, and to have a constant sense of reciprocity. You know? uh, and uh, because all the civil society organizations also, they sometimes all, also comp compete among them for the same resources, and especially in the case of mental health, because they have to apply to the same places for funding. So in this case, so it's just to try to, let's say, to move on a much more cooperative level rather than a collaborative level. No? So a place that they, it's much more easy to interact with. And the last one is that we took a special opportunity on the mental health national pact that in Catalonia is going to take place in, in the next month. And the idea is that also to, to again, uh, open up, let's say, what I think that is possible through citizen science is to uh, avoid the reductionistic view of, of mental health care. So it is generally put the pressure, uh, maybe also in other terms, uh, is what uh, Teresa was mentioning before, is not, no, is not to avoid the holistic view on mental health no? and try to open up this kind of spaces. And this is what citizen social science and individual experiences can take on the table, no? instead of having a discussion between the companies providing the services and the, and the public agencies that are just uh, paying for these services. Okay, so, so that's more or less also one space that I think that as a citizen social science project, um, we can just have a, a contribution that is, is at least placing the, the discussion in another level.
no? that is much, much closer to the interests of the users if we were talking in industry terms. But in this case, it would be like the people that have mental health problems and, and the public agencies that must provide the right attention to them. That's it. Thank you. Kirsten. Thanks a lot, Joseph. Yeah, maybe to pick out one aspect of those that you mentioned uh, strongly related to, no, to the topic is the, yeah, the, the aspect of data interpretation. So actually, how aware are we about the really equal engagement and powered speaking terms of uh, the local communities throughout all the different steps of a CSS cycle uh, and how does actually unbiased handing over the, the data interpretation process also play out in such a, such a cycle, no? And, and how mm, consequently is it really been done? Thank you so much. And with this, I would like to um, hand over to, to Valeria. Okay. <clears throat> Very briefly, I have many things to say in regarding to this topic, but I will pick up on two things. First of all, that for us, the social aspect of citizen social science uh, demands to build from collective experiences, right? So in our case, in environmental justice, there were a lot of uh, previous uh, community and organization experiences in producing knowledge and social mobilization for transformation towards environmental justice, including uh, social mobilization that marked a breaking point in sanitation policy in uh, the basic. Right? So in our action, rather, rather than trying to build from scratch and promote individual participation in uh, the digital platform that we co-designed with COVID searches, we, what we tried is to create synergies with existing social networks that were promoting also transformative action towards environmental justice and to collectively uh, uh, and jointly uh, develop some goals for uh, producing uh, knowledge that could lead to West transformative action uh, regarding uh, environmental justice. And what we found is that this is also very important for establishing the policy society links Right, and, and this, with this, I'm going to just answer briefly to Linda's question before. And for us, uh, we we believe that in order for citizen social science to include collective knowledge is a good way to promote uh, the policy society links. Because, for instance, in our case, uh, there is a participatory mandate in sanitation policy, as is always the case in environmental policy. And policymakers were very optimistic about being involved and being engaged to our citizen social science initiative, just because we could include collectives. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the basin, there is this participatory mandate that is mediated by, citizen, by civil society organizations that monitor pol uh, policymaking. So you know, if, if citizen social science includes collectives and civil society organizations that are linked to policy at the same time, then policymakers are, uh, feel attracted to this citizen social science initiative and feel attracted to use the knowledge created in this uh, citizen social science initiative like ours. So the, the two learning points here is, uh, first of all, that for us, participation and local knowledge involve including uh, community organizations rather than just individuals or individual citizens. And the second issue is that by doing this, then we could uh, be more, um, more, we could have more chances to actually create a policy link because policymakers are interested in this uh, connection with civil society organization and social mobilization that are part of the participatory mandate in environmental policies. Thank you so much, Valeria. Thanks everyone. And yeah, I would now invite in again our expert respondents and, and maybe ask Jill directly, uh, maybe a bit with the focus given the, the insights we gain now on um, on the aspect of ownership. So when we talk about no, what Teresa mentioned, the creation of new spaces for civil society actors, uh, but also the aspect of data interpretation. But what do we really have to consider now that uh, real ownership is given and that it's not rather like no, a, a covering up or a, you know, a temporary, let's say, um, activity a check checkbox. Um, first, I'm sure you, you can share from your local 
uh, experience how this can look like? Yes, I'll try to be brief because there's a lot of things on this topic and of course we continue, we can continue to discuss after, but I think um, uh, Joseph brings some interesting that we used a lot here, that is the idea of citizen generated data. And uh, uh, we are, because I know you know that, but I must say, and, and Valeria, uh, makes a fundamental point, which is recognize what exists in terms of collective knowledge in the community. You know that it's 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 necessary to recognize there that there is always citizen science being done in community. Communities have always been organized. Different kind of communities uh, uh, have always been organized by the production of evidence, data, epistemologies. So. When we when we are talking about come to some to some to some community or to some organization that is uh, working around an issue, they have a lot of great things that we can just um, learn to adapt to our to, to the way that we talk or the way that we can spread more that that knowledge or or complex more that th this knowledge. So um, we have a lot of good and bad experiences uh, between this idea of knowledge meetings or diverse knowledge qualification meetings. And I'm really curious about how you experience that because, um, because there's, uh, there's always, um, uh, there's always a neutrality, you know, there's no neutrality on this space. There's no way to have neutrality on this space. And it's always competing levels on this space because we are talking about diverse people that are on different layers of different kind of experiences in the society. So I love these experiences. I think CSS could create more spaces of knowledge and of change, but we need to trust, really trust on, 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 on the people that we are working with. And I think we can be able to get feedback from them and not just, and not, and not just give feedback for them. And we need to part from the point, to part from the point that this space will never, uh, will never be neutral, neutral. And this space will always uh, accept, need to accept some, um, some um, competitions, some uh, differences. Um, so. Thanks so much. Jill. So very transparent and open embracement of existing and remaining power dimensions that may change, that may shift, but there are always some sort of power dimensions. Linda, what can the distinct role of CSS uh, you think be to, to bring policy making closer to civil society? Yeah, I think there was a very important point made on um, agenda setting, which I would um, take. I think I, I said thinking about the points in which we can, the, we have opportunity to set the agenda. Um, and I think really knowledge of the political process and the political nuances is important to know how to engage. So I would say um, one of the things we've been trying to study is how different parliaments, you know, work across the African continent and when they are most likely to take up law or to pass a, a new law. And we realize that this happens in the very first two years of being in, in power. And so because of two reasons, one that the, um, they are, many of them are new, like members of parliament are new um, and so they're, they're open to new ideas. Um, sometimes they haven't really taken party positions, but then also to realize that in the very end of the political process, uh, people go into campaigns. And so they really don't care for new legislation. They know that um, you know, people will not vote for them for the legislative work that they did, but mostly if they please in terms of developmental work in their constituencies. And so knowing when the agenda um, is, is, is going to be agreeable to policymakers. It's very important to know this is how the political process works. This is the political life cycle. 
And this is when we really need to talk to them to engage in these political agendas. And I think this happens at every stage um, of the political agenda. Um, so when do we agenda set? So that, that really came in. I also like the point that Joseph made on um, reciprocity. Um, and um, there's been discussions around you know, how do we share data, even from the big tech companies that we talk about that have the power to do research, that they can fund research and get us to, do, to space and, you know, but really do we benefit from this research? If for instance, there's been calls about companies like Google and Facebook having more data than the government has data. And so what you see is more and more countries coming in to collect data themselves, but they actually have this data. But we need data for development. That where we, what are we doing with the research that we're getting in from academia and institutions? How are we making them mainstream? So that startups are building on this knowledge, civil society organizations are building on this knowledge and the data that has been put in place. I also think that finally, there's need for us to think through, in terms of you asked about civil society engagement. Um, my learnings on this has been that maybe the term civil society has evolved in a way that maybe they don't need to be called civil society anymore. And I'm saying that because of our context where you see organizations that are called civil society in Uganda were shut down, their bank accounts were shut down and they're not able to do much. But civil society really is life-changing. They give a voice to those who do not have, they continue to fund research that is needed. And so how do we get to a place where organizations don't have to see themselves as, you know, um, the the enemy of government when ordinarily they are filling in the gaps. So we see organizations that are now moving towards calling themselves think tanks, and yet they are civil society organizations because of the way that civil society is perceived in political processes. So I think that we need to see how we craft this data in a way that it's not detested, but it's actually something that people see as important uh, because in political processes, they prefer that you know, trade associations, they listen to trade associations, for example, who they see as making sense in terms of economics of a society, and then ignore civil society organizations. So how do we balance the human rights and development impact with the economic needs that, that people have? Yeah, those would be my comments, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Linda. So so the, the very important aspect of timing, reciprocity also, no, the acknowledgement that data sources are diversifying and that also weighs out very differently in, in different political and economic contexts. Thank you so much. Kulia, perhaps uh, from your very specific uh, city council perspective, can you, can you maybe respond and, and share like where there would be actually the, the best moments to interact or the best mechanisms to interact? Yes, uh, I would like to vote on one specific point. Um, that is this idea of the inclusive policy making and how citizen social science in this case uh, can um, can boost uh, more inclusive policy making. Um, I think that there is a huge challenge there also for citizen scientists, not only for the administration. The idea that we need, of course, a more um, a tone of policy making that takes into account the diversity of our cities and have a really inclusionary point of view, both on what I was before talking about, so on the diagnosis of public problems and also on the proposition of solutions to this public problem. Um, I think, of course, citizen science can do a lot for this, but it's important to see who participates in this citizen science. Now, from my experience, that it's not exactly on citizen science projects, but on uh, participatory public processes or deliberative uh, policies, um, is that you really need to go to uh, look for the people. You cannot wait for people to come to you because then you keep working in general, maintaining some kind of biases. Of course, we have more men, we have more elderly people, uh, we have more uh, middle or high resources people, no educational level. Uh, and so I think this is one of the biggest challenges of any kind of participation. So also on science that tries to be more collaborative or more participatory. Um, well, basically, I think that from the point of the city council, maybe we can do some kind of help here because we have uh, you know, any city council or any administration, but I think that especially city council that work from the proximity with people can have schools, libraries, other kind of public facilities that can help to, uh, let's say, 
um, try to break these biases that in general appear if you don't do a specific for a specific effort for that. And I'm sure you all know that and you try to work on that, but I want to mention it because I think that from the point of public policy, this is especially interesting. And so uh, I go back to this, but I think this is an important challenge from the part of policymakers in relation to citizen science. If we go to this, um, and what I do get from, from these projects, from collaborating with citizen science projects, I think that for the administration, it's a real change if we get uh, results no, and data and impressions from an inclusion point of view, because it's not easy for the administration to get this kind of, uh, this kind of views, this kind of approaches to a biggest part of our society. No? So we really face these challenges when we try to do more participatory projects. And uh, I think that um, if citizen science projects get the way to be more inclusive, they are also more interesting for the administration. Though. So this, this should be a point to work on. I think. Thank you so much, Julia, reminding us that inclusive policymaking, but also research underlying policymaking is a never ending proactive activity throughout all the facets of, of the process, which does not stop with the selection of, of, your, of your research group, of your participant group, because also there, the way people engage so much relates to so many different contexts, circumstances, traumas. We would get in all kinds of details now, it's a whole discussion on itself. Um, which needs attention and increasing and repetitive attention all throughout uh, research cycles and policy making cycles. Thank you all so much. I would so love to keep this discussion going. We will now open up to the audience, um, running a little bit over time. My excuses for that. So I see Andrew, you already have your hand up for a while. I would hand over to you. Uh, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you a little bit. Hello. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm, I am new here. And let's see if I can do video. Okay, good, good. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, we have not been introduced, so um, I think I'll skip the introduction, but thank you for the invitation. And, uh, I know we're short on time, so I will just get straight to my point, I wanted to comment on what Linda said earlier about, about civil society and how perhaps it's better if, if we did not use that name. Um, I, I, I wanted to respectfully disagree because we have social groups and the name civil society, what scares them, I know, is they're getting into politics. But if you're a citizen, the whole point of being a citizen is that and through your connection is, is a bit shaky, so we cannot hear you right now. Andrew? I think we we lost Andrew. Perhaps meanwhile, let's see if he comes back. Uh, meanwhile, are there any other questions? I will take one more question for the sake of time, but I will offer you an opportunity to continue this discussion in a little bit. So any other, anyone else with feedback, with questions, comments, now's the moment. No one? Okay, Josep. Yeah, no, thank you very much for all the feedback, uh, especially to the respondents, because I think that it really enriches uh, uh, the debate that we were having inside the project. And and, and I, I don't know, maybe it's a question, I don't know if it is a question or a comment, I don't really know about that, honestly, but but uh, you were mentioning about data, no? that, that that's something that at least uh, from my side, and I have I'm much, train on data and coming from physics and so on. So it's very relevant because uh, my feeling is that uh, sometimes, uh, and that's something that Linda already mentioned, that is that the data that we have is not responding what, what we want to answer. And uh, I don't know, so you, you, the three mentioned something like that. No? And that's one thing that I think that is really, really important and challenging 
And another thing is also related to what Julia was mentioning that, uh, that I think that in the local level is very necessary is also to try to change also the culture in science of working much more collaboratively, you know, and much more in a cooperative manner instead of in a competitive manner. You know? So that's in a way that sharing data, yes, but many other things are related to that. Also sharing knowledge and strategies because maybe only with data, we will not be able to answer what we want to answer. I don't know, Kirsty, it's a question common, but it's just to at least provoke the, the respondents. Thank you so much. Does anyone want to respond um, to this? And otherwise, exclusively for the sake of the time, I would hand over, well, first of all, I'm posting now in the chat the link to tomorrow, we will uh, stream uh, a video, a little film we created about the research and innovation actions that have been run throughout the three years in more detail. And parallel to that, we will open a Zoom chat as we have here and now to then also give the space to dive deeper into discussion, to post these questions again. And we will have another hour or so there of time to discuss for everyone who, um, who would like to, to join us tomorrow so we can continue this very intriguing, interesting discussion since, uh, yeah, time we have does not just uh, to, to, I think, the importance of these discussions and also the very different facets we could still address. More than that, um, this is our final event week, but it's not the, the end of COAC. We will keep going still for various months and also in our different consortium um, entities beyond that. And here the link to all our, to the website, to the social media channels, where we we'll keep informing you and engaging you about uh, the continuous activities of our work. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Katja now again for a tiny little wrap up before Wow, there is still we time for a wrap up. Them. What a luxury. That is great. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I will make it really short. So I, since since we had said this, I also had one task that related to the evaluation and the co-evaluation of this project. I'm, of course, very interested in these kind of discussions. And I am so happy for all the feedback that we got today. Uh, we took notes. Uh, there is a link in the chat uh, to this notepad. So please have a look. Uh, Andrew, if you can't, if you have an unstable network, please put your comment in the pad. Uh, we would really appreciate having feedback from all of you. And uh, the things that I noted down is especially in relation to flexibility, which I found very interesting, is this multiplicity of flexibility. And it was even enriched today uh, towards all aspects that uh, let leave me here again thinking we need a lot of skills, right? And many, especially coming from research, are not trained in all these kind of skills we need in this kind of uh, multitude of flexibilities that were uh, described today. So we need to step up this skill uh, making and capacity building here. But we also need to understand that it's not one person that can have all these skills inside her or him. But it's more important, as Joseph said, to collaborate and to, to find uh, adjust, adjacent or complementary uh, skills with people uh, for collaboration. And uh, interestingly enough, it's we all found, I think, in this project, uh, the importance of the role of the facilitators and uh, people who are very good with group dynamics. And those things uh, we definitely need to uh, learn more. And the second topic is the uh, local, the building of the local experience. I found very interesting which topics came up today, uh, which has a lot to do with responsibility. What is the role of the scientists? They can't be like the neutral mediators in between, but what how, how do we deal with this role and how do we deal uh, with the power of citizen social science, especially to counter this individualization, this also very neoliberal individualization um, uh, things that are happening around us, these kind of movements. And uh, we and we should even build more on the uh, opportunities the citizen social science uh, gives us to counter this individualization trends and to, to build more collectives, right? And uh, then, of course, for that, the whole timing that also Linda has referred to and many others have, the timing of the agenda setting is super important. And there we need to learn from 
the communities. They are the experts in that. And I think we need to be even more attentive to that knowledge. So this is for me, a uh, very rich conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope we all stay in touch for uh, continuing these conversations and please join us in the next two days. And yeah, do in, in doing what, what all of you do, I wish you all the best. And uh, yeah, I think we can say not forever goodbye, but goodbye for today now, Kersti, can we? Yeah, thank everyone. Thank you so much also again for Jill, Linda and Julia to, to share your uh, amazing expertise and experience with us. I think uh, having these conversations shows how important these cross linkages between the communities and how much value actually this community strengthening uh, actually has to learn from each other and to grow together in our really joint uh, objective to, to be more inclusive and participatory. So thanks everyone. Ha, I have one more question. Can <laughs> those who can uh, uh, put on the camera so that we can have one oh. more, uh, so just a quick screenshot uh, of not so many dark screens. This would be so <laughs> nice to see you also. Hi Sandra, hi Patricia in the mountains. Hi Andrew, hi Veronica and whoever. Yeah, hi Stefan. Whoever can also. So I will do a screenshot now. Hey, Ine. Hi, Dina Lee. So, whoops. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now it's a goodbye. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks Thank so much. You.